Hello everyone, it's Mark Goodacre here. Welcome to the NT Pod, the podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. It's episode 103, and today I'm in conversation with Dr. Elizabeth schrader Polzer. Today's NT Pod is a conversation with Dr. Elizabeth schrader Polzer, who is the Assistant Professor of New Testament at Villanova University. She recently defended her PhD with us in the Graduate Programme in Religion at Duke University, and its title was Those Who Love Me Will Keep My Word, Narrative Variants in New Testament Gospel Stories. And in this podcast, we talk quite a bit about that work and some related topics. I hope you enjoy it. Very warm welcome to the podcast to Dr. Elizabeth schrader Poltzar. It's great to have you uh, here. I mean, we have known each other for several years now, even before, oh, yeah. even before you became a student at Duke University. But tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, where you are in, in your career at the moment. Sure. So, yeah, I surprisingly to myself, I am now a professor of New Testament at uh, Villanova University. I mean, when uh, maybe about 10 years ago, um, I was a singer songwriter and a piano mm-hmm. teacher living in New York City. And I um, had written a song about Mary Magdalene, and I sort of got interested in looking at, uh, I wanted to look at the world's oldest copy of the Go- the Gospel of John because mm-hmm. of my interest in Mary Magdalene. And, you know, I was I was in my 30s at that time. I was, I was an adult, <laughs> and I knew who I was. I, I had an identity. I'm a musician, right? And then I was like, oh, well, I'm just interested in this thing. Oh, this, you know, somebody should look at this. And and this research that I did basically took me down a rabbit hole. I mean, I remember very vividly, you know, I'm a piano teacher. I teach kids piano or I'm playing a show. I'm a singer songwriter. I'm on tour. I'm making a record. Like those are the sorts of things that I did for quite a while. I was a music major in undergrad. And now here I am. I'm a professor. I'm, I'm a tenure track professor at a, at a fancy or Villanova is a great university. I'm like, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. This is very strange. The whole the whole uh, journey was, is very unexpected to me, how it all happened. And we don't need to go into all of those details. But I would say that it's surprising to me every day that I wake up. I'm like, oh, I'm a professor. How weird. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, do you know what? I've been at this game for many, many years. And I still wake up and say, I am one of the luckiest people in the world. Uh, it is just yeah. so, it is a wonderful uh, job to have. And, you know, if you're it, like, you like me, I, you enjoy being in the classroom, oh, right? Yes, definitely, yeah. And I think students pick up on that enthusiasm mm-hmm. and it does carry over into mm-hmm. your research. And mm-hmm. that's what we're going to be talking about on the podcast today. Yeah. And so thank you so much for joining us. So Libby, you did a dissertation here I at did. Duke University yeah. and it was excellent. I had incredible guidance, oh. wonderful readers, <laughs> fantastic committee. <laughs> well, actually, why do you tell the why do you tell the listeners who your committee was actually? Because uh, because there's quite a few famous names in there. Well, yeah, and it, so um, Jennifer Knust is my advisor, and she was the the chair of the dissertation, and Mark Goodacre was the second reader. <laughs> <laughs> He's here. Um, and then uh, we needed some textual critics and some Nag Hammadi experts, and also we need a classics person for the kind of things that I'm doing. So we also invited Tommy Wasserman, Bart Ehrman, uh, Nicola Denzi Lewis, and William Johnson. Mm -hmm. And that's a big committee. Mm -hmm. And I was a little worried that everybody was going to be at each other's throats or there'd be too many cooks in the kitchen or something like that. But we actually had a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. It went very, very well. And we actually did need all of those perspectives Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. the ground I was trying to cover. It went I, it was a fantastic committee. I was, uh, I'm was, i deeply grateful to have had people with so much expertise get to look it over and to give me their feedback and to really make it as strong as possible. I hope to be mm-hmm. making a, a contribution to the field and to the way that we think about the text of the New Testament. Fantastic, yeah. No, it was, it was I mean, I love being on that committee. I mean, going back to how great it is and what a privilege it is to be a professor somewhere like this. You, you meet these great minds and you have amazing mm-hmm. conversations and they were great conversations. And they definitely. all had different perspectives, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Tommy and Bart are both textual critics, but they have very different approaches to the text. And I, I needed Tommy's mm-hmm. view and I needed Bart's view. Mm-hmm. And so to to make the strongest possible dissertation, this was actually a perfect committee. I, I thought it was going to be unwieldy to have six <laughs> sort of heavy hitting type A people there, but it all went really well. Yeah, fantastic. So 
tell the listeners what the topic of the dissertation was, what the title was, and what the sure. what you were trying to achieve in this piece. Yes, absolutely. So the name of the dissertation is "Those Who Love Me Will Keep My Word." Uh, that's a reference to uh, the the farewell discourse in the Gospel mm-hmm. of John. Narrative variants in New Testament gospel stories. So the sort of point the 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 thing that I wanted to explore in this dissertation as a textual critic we get exposed to many textual variants in manuscripts usually the most ancient manuscripts and something that has sort of frustrated me along the way is that there's often this sort of assumption that we ha- we know what the text right. says right. <laughs> you know well this is what Matthew says this is what Luke says this is what John says when in fact if you drill down and you look at the most ancient manuscript record there is there is textual variation and i think most people have some awareness of that. They know that manuscripts were copied by hand, not by a printing Mm -hmm. press, and that, you know, scribes made mistakes or occasionally maybe a copyist made a mistake uh, or or inserted their own idea into the text, Mm -hmm. though that's less, less common. But the question that I was trying to cover is, if you really just look at the earliest record, it's not just that there's like changes of word order or maybe a synonym or an occasional mistake or an occasional change. It's that Really, there are variations in the narrative. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. narratives of the Gospels themselves are different from manuscript to manuscript of the same story in the same Gospel. Mm-hmm. And this is something that textual critics are aware of. And oftentimes, um, the Guild of Textual Criticism tries to recover a singular text. Mm-hmm. These days, they would call it the Ausgangs text, but in uh, that's like sort of the initial mm-hmm. circulating text. But in previous decades and centuries, textual critics were really trying to get to the autographs. They're mm-hmm. trying to find out what the authors wrote. These days, there's more of a, a, a concession, like, well, we're not, we can't actually get back to it because oftentimes our earliest manuscripts are in the third century right. mm-hmm. and the author might be writing in the first century. So what's happening in that time in between, we don't know. So what we can try to do is reconstruct as far back as the circulating text mm-hmm. allows. And we don't know what happened in between the author and this initial uh, stream of text that we have access to. And so um, there has been a sort of concession that, oh, we can't necessarily get to the autograph, but there's still an attempt to construct this a singular text, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. like, what is the earliest circulating text that we can try to reconstruct? And what I'm saying is, first of all, if we're being honest, oftentimes textual critics disagree with one mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. Like, well, this is the initial circulating text because X, Y, Z, and they'll make sort of like a, it's almost like a persuas- persuasive legal argument mm-hmm. for this one. But then there's always people who um, dissent and say, oh, well, no, I think that this is the earliest circulating mm-hmm. text because... A, B, C. And, and the, th- oftentimes you'll have competing arguments for which one is the mm-hmm. earliest. And this is something that oftentimes New, Text- New Testament uh, exegetes don't want to think about. Oh, just yeah. tell us what yeah. the text is. Just yeah. tell us what the right answer is, and then we'll interpret the word of God, and then we'll tell everyone. Mm-hmm. And occasionally you will get some... You know, for instance, this there's a very well-known one. I think it's in Mark 141 where does Jesus compassionate toward this man with leprosy or does mm-hmm. is he angry mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. man with leprosy? And so um, there are certain translations that will say that Jesus was angry mm-hmm. and, and some will say that Jesus was compassionate. And so an, a, a, an average lay person might say, oh, wait, was Jesus angry or mm-hmm. was he compassionate? And different translations will flag mm-hmm. that manuscript variant for you as well as the fact that there is dissent Mm -hmm. within the text critical community, but that's an exception. I would say that most of the time, the Nestle Aland uh, Greek text, uh, the Greek critical edition, gets translated into English or French or Swahili or whatever and Mm -hmm. say, okay, well, that's what the author wrote. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. you know that there's these manuscript variants in the footnotes, but (laughs) you just kind of don't pay Mm -hmm. attention to that. (laughs) But I'm interested in those variants below because sometimes they actually change the story itself, which creates sometimes exegetical consequences, Mm -hmm. interpretive consequences. And oftentimes those variants below the line, sometimes there are people who say, I really think it might be this one. Mm -hmm. And we can't ever be certain. So it's this uncertainty that I interested in and the narrative multiplicity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that multiplicity, I think that this is sort of what I land on in the dissertation. This is central to what the Gospels are. Right. The Gospels have never been a singular story. That, that would be the diatessaron, mm-hmm. which, mm-hmm. Is what, which was what the church rejected, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the Gospels have always been about multiple perspectives. And so I basically end up comparing very early textual variants 
to Matthew's version, uh, the parallel Matthew versus Mark versus mm-hmm. Luke's version of a parallel pericope. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, it is very much that way. Mm. Different manuscripts of Matthew might have different perspectives on what happened with Jesus and the rich young man, right? right? right. Yeah. And we don't actually know which one Matthew mm-hmm. wrote. And mm-hmm. so, and each different version has different exegetical consequences. So I basically call for a, more of an embrace of that multiplicity mm-hmm. and an acknowledgement that we that, that we can't be certain. And maybe there's something about the uncertainty and about the multiplicity that almost theologically, we should embrace mm-hmm. as scholars, mm-hmm. that that's okay. Do you think in some ways what you're doing, or at least what's in the background, is you're answering that point, which you will sometimes hear, especially in apologetics mm. kind of literature, which says that, okay, there are these variants, mm. but they're really insignificant. You don't need to worry about those. Let's just like kind of put those all to one side. And what you're saying is, no, it's not about worrying about them. And it's certainly not about ignoring them. It's about saying they tell a story yeah. and they tell a really interesting story. And if we, if we do try and shunt them away, we're actually being less faithful to the text Correct. by doing yes. that. Is that right? Exactly. We are being less faithful to the text. And oftentimes, uh, so something that Jennifer Knust, my advisor, um, has highlighted is that in the Guild of New Testament scholarship, there is something that she calls very, she's kind of cheeky, <laughs> textual desire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so there's textual desire for a singular text. What is the true word of God? And people mm-hmm. are so eager to know it because they want to interpret it. But she's saying that textual desire interferes with our being able to see the evidence Mm -hmm. for what it is, Mm -hmm. which is that there is uncertainty about the text. And um, also one of the things that you raised, actually, when you Mm -hmm. were reading the dissertation, is that when you uh, when you focus on a singular text or just the text printed above the line in the critical edition, you are you're participating in marginalization mm-hmm. because there mm-hmm. are voices that had a different perspective on what the text mm-hmm. of the gospel was. This they had a different version of the story in John or this story in Luke, and that was their gospel mm-hmm. text. And you know, in the fourth century, the third century, you know, we can't really get much back much earlier than that. Um, one of the ones that I often like talking about is. Uh, Bishop Nisitas in the 5th century, his copy of Luke uh, says that um, Elizabeth sang the Magnificat. Right. And, uh, Nisitas l- talks about that. Yeah, he says, oh, yeah, you know, when Elizabeth yeah. sang the, the mm-hmm. Magnificat, you know, Elizabeth was barren. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh, you know, and there are manuscripts, there are Latin manuscripts, mm-hmm. there are manuscripts that say that it was not Mary who sang, my soul doth magnify the Lord. It was Elizabeth that mm-hmm. sang that. And so Bishop I mean, he was a bishop, yeah, Nisitas, yeah, and he's yeah. he's writing, I believe, in the fifth century. So that's that's quite a ways in. And who are we to say Nisitas is wrong and totally marginalize mm-hmm. his perspective on the text? These are all parts of how faithful Christians have interpreted their gospel, and this is a sacred text to them. Mm-hmm. And so if you force it to the side, there there is a marginalization that we are participating mm-hmm. in. And um, I also sort of land on it being about who has the power to determine what mm-hmm. the text is. Mm-hmm. And people don't want to think about that. They're like, this is the word of God. This is what God said. Or, or even New Testament scholars who are even more secular just say, oh, that's too much trouble. Like, mm-hmm. we know that yeah. Mary <laughs> sang the Magnificat. Yeah. Let's not think about that. And I'm sort of drawing, I, I'm, I'm trying to invite <laughs> rather than insist. I'm trying to invite people to say, you know, what if we broaden our idea of what the gospels are? Mm-hmm. That's that's very similar to saying that, you know, Mark has a perspective and Matthew has a perspective. And isn't that, that's more inclusive of the the community of Christianity throughout the ages. That's more inclusive mm-hmm. of what Christianity well, has been. Well, one of the things that I loved about the dissertation was, was finding out that there is a bride Mm. in some texts of the Matthew 25 parable, the parable of the 10 virgins. Yes, I'll be presenting on this at SBL if anybody's coming to San Antonio. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. (laughs) But one of the things that that shows is that missing pieces like that or or, or narrative variants are actually people sometimes. Oh, that's true. So, um, I mean, and I, uh, one of the reasons that I found that so fascinating, the presence of a new character, Mm -hmm. is that Boltman, you know, once said, there is no one in any parable that's extraneous to the narrative. And, you know, the prodigal son story, he says the mother's not mentioned because she doesn't need to be and so on. And I thought, yeah, but Libby, Libby (laughs) has has illustrated. 
created <laughs> that sometimes you actually find that that uh, and it's particularly interesting that it's the woman that's been forgotten well, in that exactly. story isn't it and you have to raise an eyebrow about that what's going on here mm-hmm. like how, what is going on with that I, I think in that case I'm arguing that it might have something to do with early controversy about the bridal chamber right. which is mm-hmm. some which is a big thing in it's second huge. century Christianity certainly in Valentinianism and other types of not not always like a in the for instance in the Acts of Thomas there is discussion of the bridal chamber it's it's sort of a an early Christian perhaps ritual that took place or some sort of doctrine of salvation mm-hmm. that had to do with something that took place in the bridal chamber and um so when the 25 when sorry when the 10 virgins in Matthew 25 1 they go out to meet the bride Bridegroom and the bride. Mm-hmm. That may have doctrinal significance for people who are reading this text mm-hmm. and how they're interpreting it. And um, so, who are the ten virgins mm-hmm. in that case? Mm-hmm. Like, are they? Some people would say maybe that they're representing the church. But if the bride is in the text, mm-hmm. then maybe she's representing the church. Right. And then who who is she and who are the – it changes the exegesis of the passage. And we really have to reckon with that and also to consider that some ancient Christians did reckon with it. Um, I think I talk about Methodius. Mm-hmm. Methodius, too, is, um, I think he's third century. Mm-hmm. He's a very old writer in mm-hmm. Christianity, and he seems to have the bride in his text. And he's an Orthodox writer, um, but he, he has to reckon with it being in his text. And so these are the sorts of – significant variants that um, that totally change our interpretation. And mm-hmm. by the way, that one's also in the Vulgate. So right, it's that, right. it's that yeah, pervasive. Yeah, Vulgate yeah. says that there's a bride in that verse. And, it, and the thing is, the fact that I didn't know that mm. really illustrates your point, mm. which is that people, I mean, I've looked at that text over and mm. over again. I've thought about it. I've thought about it synoptically and different. Well, it's, mm. it's only in Matthew, but I mean, I've thought about, you know, why, why does Luke not include it and mm. so on and so on. Mm never noticed the missing bride. So right. it really illustrates your point. And, and I'm a yeah. kind of a nerd that likes this kind of stuff and I hadn't noticed it. The thing is, there, there, your dissertation is packed full of great examples like this. I mean, how many is it? In, in, in It's the... about, I think I have about 30 in there. Wow, okay, cool. Yeah. And if you're asking what my favorite is, I mean, everybody's going to think, oh, it's the Mary Martha question <laughs> in John I 11. Thought, I thought it might be that, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, I mean, that's, that is uh-huh. one, that is, the what's well, more what I'm known for is I my Harvard Theological Review article where mm-hmm. I argue that perhaps Martha is an interpolation into John's mm-hmm. gospel based on some really important textual variants, not only in Papyrus 66, which is the oldest copy of that story that we have in John 11, but throughout the entire manuscript record. In, uh, in the article, I talk about Greek, Latin, Greek and Latin mostly, but I do talk briefly about the Syriac, but in Coptic and also now in Ge'ez. Well, uh, okay. Duke has like, some yeah. Ge'ez manuscripts, and you can see that the Mary's... They're like Ethiopic uh, yes, uh, manuscripts, Coptic. right. Yeah. Even throughout. So that that is um, what I'm known for, and that was sort of the impetus for how common is this sort of right, story sure. changing. So if I may just, just pause for a second there and, and say one thing, I'll make sure that you, a link to your Harvard Theological Review oh, articles yeah. in the show notes. Sure. But um, could I just ask you, just for people who aren't familiar, I mean, mm-hmm. we decided we weren't going to talk about this for the whole podcast because I really wanted to talk to Libby about her dissertation, which expands on on that work. But having said that, there will be listeners that aren't yet familiar with, mm-hmm. with it. Could you just give us a potted summary of what it is that you've discovered and what your thesis is about what you've discovered on John 11? Absolutely. So um, uh, I actually got into graduate work because I was looking at this world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John, Papyrus 66. And I didn't even know Greek at the time, but I was using sort of an interlinear study Mm -hmm. Bible and uh, an academic had sent me a link to Papyrus 66, which is the world's oldest copy of John 11. And you can see that the name Mary has been crossed out Mm -hmm. a couple of times. The first time it's changed to say Martha, and the second time it's changed to say Hi Adelphi, the sisters. And the verbs are changed from singular to plural. And to someone who had no training at that time, I was like, oh, they're adding Martha to this story. That's what it looked like. Mm-hmm. And I was like, has anybody done any work on this? And I realized that nobody had. And that was why I entered graduate work. <laughs> and it became my master's thesis. And I ended up looking for that thesis, I don't know, about 150 transcriptions of John, which mm-hmm. you can find through the uh, univers- the University of Birmingham has like a website called Johannes.com. And you can mm-hmm. look at hundreds of transcriptions there. Now I've looked at I think 280. Cool. And um, there's. And I just have to say that's my old haunting ground. Uh, ah, so, Birmingham, so, yes. So it's lovely when I hear Birmingham oh, mentioned yes. uh, and think yeah. of uh, my colleagues over there. Yeah, they do incredibly important textual mm-hmm. work over there. And so so my master's thesis was um, basically pointing out hey, look, um, it looks at Martha's presence is unstable throughout mm-hmm. the entire 
textual transmission of the Gospel of John. And every time I look in a new place, I find more problems. Mm-hmm. As I was mentioning, the most recent place I've looked is the Ge'ez manuscript. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely Mary's and Martha's mixed up in mm-hmm. the Ge'ez transmission, as well as manuscripts where just Mary's doing something where mm-hmm. your Bible would say that Martha did it. So there's you got it also in the Ethiopic, but... Also, the, the artistic record, um, which is something that I found since publishing that, oftentimes the oldest uh, sarcophagi depicting the Lazarus story only have one sister. So mm-hmm. the thesis is, is it possible that Martha, someone who had read Luke's gospel, someone who had read Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, where there's two sisters named Martha and Mary, mm-hmm. and they have no brother mm-hmm. <laughs> in yeah. that story, and they seem yeah. to be in the north, maybe Samaria, mm-hmm. Um Jesus encounters these sisters, and Martha is busy and distracted with much service, and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and um, Jesus defends Mary because Martha complains, you know, she's like, why isn't my sister helping me? And she says, oh, Martha, Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. Everyone knows that story of Martha and Mary. They don't, biblical scholars think about it, but not everyone thinks about the fact that there's no brother Mm -hmm. featured in that story. Whereas in John's gospel, Lazarus is introduced as having two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what my... But just uh, when I saw this mm-hmm. Papyrus 66 and you see the name Mary getting changed to Martha and the, the woman getting split into two in John 11 verse 3, you're like, wait a second. It looks like they're taking that character, Martha, from Luke's gospel and sticking her mm-hmm. into John. Mm-hmm. So, And then I basically did a survey of the entire manuscript record of John, and it shows that Martha's presence is unstable throughout mm-hmm. the entire the entire textual transmission, basically one in five Greek mm-hmm. manuscripts has some sort of problem around Martha. When I came to Duke, of course, the first place I looked was at Duke's gospel manuscripts. Mm-hmm. The fifth one that I looked at had a very <laughs> changed to Martha. I remember, you, I, remember, <laughs> I remember you saying this, yeah. And so so you think that at some early point, so I mean, I know you you talked about trying to get away too much from talking about the original text or the early, earlier circulating text, but your thesis is that at an early point... yes somebody or some people added in an extra character to that story under the influence of Luke 10. Correct. That is that is the theory. Mm-hmm. And I basically what I am arguing is that so what what does Martha do mm-hmm. in John's gospel? Mm-hmm. Like why is why is she even there? Okay, well it's easy to see what Martha's mm-hmm. big moment is. It's, yeah. it's the central thesis statement of the gospel of yeah. John. <laughs> it's yeah. the Christological yeah. confession at John 11 verse 27 mm-hmm. where she says, "Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world." Right. And um people have often said that that is the thesis statement of John because it matches what the the evangelist concludes with in John 20 That's verse right, 31. Yeah. It's yeah, basically a sense. match to what mm-hmm. the evangelist concludes with um, in what is considered to be the perhaps first ending to John's gospel at the end of John chapter 20. So um, I'm saying, okay, well, why would you put Martha in there? And um, in the course of my research for the Harvard Theological Review article, I learned that uh, Tertullian, who is a church father who wrote at the turn of the third century, in his treatise Against Praxius, which is sort of a defense of Christianity, every single copy of Against Praxius says that Mary confessed Jesus as the mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's say that you have a, a version of John where Lazarus only has one sister name, and it's Mary, and she is confessing Jesus as the Christ. The other thing is that we also know that as far back as we can go in interpretation history, people thought that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Hippolytus of Rome seems to think so. The Manichaeans seem to think so. Ambrose certainly mm-hmm. thought so. So if people think that... Lazarus's sister Mary, Mary of Bethany, is Mary Magdalene. There's reasons that people might think that maybe because when she anoints Jesus in John chapter 12, he says, let her save it for the day of my burial. Mm -hmm. And there's Mm -hmm. only one woman named Mary who goes to Jesus' tomb, and that's Mary Magdalene Mm -hmm. in John's gospel, right? So we're just thinking about John's gospel here. We're not thinking about history or like what really happened. We're thinking about the sort of intention Mm -hmm. of the evangelist. I'm saying, well, if there was a text form of John where it's just Lazarus and Mary, and then uh, people think that this Mary might be Mary Magdalene, and then she's mm-hmm. confessing Jesus is mm-hmm. Christ. That makes her a central character yeah, yeah, <laughs> in this yeah. gospel. I mean, it's such a fascinating thesis, and and I do want to talk some more about the other things oh, yeah. in the dissertation. <laughs> but, I mean, you haven't yet fully persuaded me of the identity in John between those, between those two women. But mm-hmm. what I think can't be gainsaid, definitely, is that so many people in, in everywhere you look saw Mary of Bethany as being 
Mary Magdalene. Yes, they do. I mean, yeah. the, you even get Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha, you know, cropping oh, uh, up, yes, you know. And so, so if, if the, Martha were <laughs> added, then all they did just yeah. throw it all together. <laughs> and of course, one of the things that, that always amuses me is how quickly scholarly conventions mm -hmm. become so accepted that people kind of read them into the text. So I, for years, used the phrase Mary of Bethany because yes. I wanted to distinguish her from Mary Magdalene. But that's a scholarly convention. Mm -hmm. John doesn't call her Mary of Bethany. He just no. calls her Mary. Correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, or Lazarus' I, is Sister Mary. You can go that yes, way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. So absolutely fascinating that is. But um, I asked you what your favorite yes. one well, so is. That was, so, this one was the impetus. Yeah, that's the, the impetus. John 11 okay. one was the impetus. And of course, I've done a lot Mm -hmm. of work on that one and a lot of podcasts on that one. We don't mm -hmm. need to keep doing exactly, that. Uh, yeah. But I would say I am very interested, I would say, uh, in the ones that have to do with instability around the women and mm -hmm. their identities. And there's a few of them. And so this, this one definitely led me into looking at other ones. For instance, John 20, 18, mm -hmm. there are certain manuscripts that say, you know, usually... Uh, Mary goes to the other disciples um, after he sends her, right? He says, go to my to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my God and your God. And Mary goes to the disciples and usually she says, oh, I have seen the Lord and he said these things to mm -hmm. me. But there's a few manuscripts, some of them fourth century, that say the things which he said to Mary, she revealed to them. Mm -hmm. And it uses the mm -hmm. verb reveal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's like, whoa, wait a second. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is, I mean, nobody... To my knowledge, I, I, if someone can correct me, please send me the scholarship. I, I hadn't seen anything about this. Mm -hmm. This is a place where, again, textual vari variants have real exegetical consequences. In these fourth century manuscripts, Mary Magdalene is presented as a revealer. Mm -hmm. And that makes you think, wait a second. If someone had a copy of John where Mary Magdalene is revealing, mm -hmm. I think the verb is menuo. That's mm -hmm. the verb that's used um, in Codex Beze. If that is the verb, that you can ex understand why someone might write something like a Gospel of Mary, right. where Mary is the revealer of right. Jesus' teachings. Yeah. Like, wait a second. Okay, so this textual variant could actually have inspired an entire other gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that changes, and it also changes the characterization of Mary Magdalene. I, I think that sometimes I'm, I'm particularly interested in the text itself fluctuating around mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene's right. presence yeah. in John, which yeah. is partly why yeah. I think that John 11, that it is Mary Magdalene, because uh -huh. there's so mm -hmm. much fluctuation. So, so excuse me interrupting, Libby, but it's interesting there that when you talk about John 20, 18, you talk also about the Gospel of Mary. And I'll say that one of the things that I appreciated about your work, it's something I've tried to do in my own work as well, is, is try and overcome some of these canonical boundaries. Yes. I think there's still a huge canonical bias yeah. in our discipline. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can even see it in the fact that when I offer a course on non-canonical Gospels, <laughs> I get fewer people enrolling than if Aww. I teach something about the Bible. <laughs> But um, it's fascinating the thought that something like the Gospel of Mary could be influenced by someone reading the Gospel of John. And if we have that canonical bias where we don't look at things like the Gospel of Mary, we're missing a really important element, aren't we, in, in how uh, Christians talked about these things? Yeah. I, so um, this is something that I also uh, have called attention to in a different publication that um, if you're not going to learn about early Christianity, you might not understand the textual variants. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one had had talked about this textual variant and its exe ex exegetical consequences, uh, to my knowledge. And, um, and you really have to understand, you have to have read something like the Gospel of Mary to see what is going on. So to be to be fully responsible textual critics, you have to be aware of this non-canonical mm -hmm. stuff. You have to have familiarity to understand like why would that, or it's possible someone had read the text, the, sorry, it's possible that someone had read the Gospel of Mary and that caused them to change their manuscript mm -hmm. of John. That mm -hmm. is just as possible, right? right? Yeah. And so as responsible textual critics, as responsible scholars of the New Testament, if you're not reading the non-canonical stuff, you might not understand why someone would make a change Mm -hmm. in their New Testament, sorry, in their in their gospel text. And therefore, you might not be able to make the most accurate argument for which is the mm -hmm. Ausgangs text, right? right? <laughs> because you don't see the full yeah. picture of that mm -hmm. time. So um, I, I absolutely agree with you, and that is a place where our work does overlap, mm -hmm. that to fully understand what's going on at this time, you have to be familiar with this non-canonical mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love the way that you actually brought in fascinating variants in 
non-canonical gospels themselves and other texts in your in your uh, quite a few of your examples were, were of that it's one of the reasons we wanted to bring Nicola Denzi Lewis into oh, the yes, conversation as well wasn't it yeah I do talk about variants in the gospel of Mary um, and I think in the first version of the mm-hmm. dissertation I had some fun variations in things like the apocryphon of John but mm-hmm. we was like oh that's a little bit too out there <laughs> but we brought yeah. it in and I actually um, do talk about uh some like the Edgerton gospel. gospel. And and of course, that one only exists in one copy. But we talk about, um, actually, I should also mention that the way that the dissertation works is that it talks about the spectrum mm-hmm. of narrative mm-hmm. variants, that you might have the difference between one letter like Maria right. and Martha, that's just an iota or a theta, or one word, is it Mary or Elizabeth that sings the Magnificat? But sometimes you get like an extra phrase, mm-hmm. um, or sometimes you get a rewritten phrase, or sometimes you get possibly a rewritten mm-hmm. section, which I'm arguing for with the John 11 stuff, or you might get a rewritten book. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that's that's also, I, I'm, I'm trying to frame these early Christian rewritings of actual gospels, such as the Edgerton gospel, or um, even the Protevangelium of James, mm-hmm. as... Um, taking place on a spectrum. People change yeah. their stories. People right. change their sacred stories. And, and I love, I loved that business of, of showing that even one letter can make a huge difference. But then going from the spectrum from one letter all the way to an entire work, because you have a section yeah. as well on rewritings of, of, of entire gospels like Matthew rewriting Mark and so on. Yeah, and also you know, like the Diatessaron or mm-hmm. Marcion's Gospel or something like that. People don't people usually cordon that off. They, oh, right. That's a different discipline. Yeah. The rewriting yeah. of a work or mm-hmm. a a different rewriting of a gospel is different than textual criticism. Mm-hmm. And I am trying to sort of blur the lines a mm-hmm. little bit. Maybe sometimes there is some sort of similarity of this general uh, tendency at this time. And I sort of frame it in uh, this idea of rewritten scripture, mm-hmm. which has really gained a lot of traction these days in Second Temple Jewish yes, studies. Yeah. That sort of in the first century, um, there was this tendency of people to to rewrite their scriptures Mm -hmm. in in the Jewish tradition. And I'm saying, well, maybe the Christians inherited that. And also I look at classical texts as well. Like we look a little bit at the Homeric papyri. There is the Ptolemaic papyri Mm -hmm. of Homer, where you can actually see that sometimes they change the story or they reorder things. And I'm saying this is the water that the evangelists and the copyists are swimming in. People change story. I mean, it, it always amuses me when people... You know, say, I mean, I, I've been writing about John a lot recently, and uh, and it always amuses me when you look at scholarship, usually a bit more old fashioned scholarship, but when people say, well, John can't have known the synoptic gospels, because if he did, he, he clearly wouldn't have rewritten this. And I'm thinking, well, even looking at the synoptics themselves, I yeah. mean, you've got massive amount of rewriting going yes. on. And then people say, well, the, the, the Gospels, the, the, no one could have thought they were writing scripture or no one could have treated these other things as scripture because then they wouldn't have made so many changes. And you're thinking, well, have you actually read any Second Temple Jewish literature? I They're know. rewriting <laughs> scripture all the time. Yeah, they are rewriting scripture all the time. And again, that's the sort of thing that those who have textual desire mm-hmm. do not want to think <laughs> about. Let's not yeah. think about that. Mm-hmm. Let's just find the one text. But the problem is that oftentimes you then just reinstantiate the text that you assume right, that it yeah. is and that you want it to be. My uh, advisor ha- had, a, had a phrase, residual fundamentalism, which oh. he used to use. And he said that he thought the field of New Testament scholarship had it was infected by a kind of residual fundamentalism where people basically were really really anxious as soon as they get away from anything mm. that could be some kind of established text and he used it in relation to things like conjectural emendations like where you haven't even got any evidence why we're we so nervous to speculate about what could have been there you yeah. know but um, I, I've sort of, uh, when I rudely interrupted you, uh, we, were <laughs> we were talking about uh, your favorite examples. So I, I love that one in John 20, 18. Um, g- give, us, give us one more, if that's OK. Do you have another favorite? Well, you know, I've, I've noticed that I've been talking a lot about the variants around the women. Mm-hmm, and I feel mm-hmm. a little bit bad about that because this <laughs> actually has something like 30 examples. Um, but I... I guess I should also preface by saying some of these no one had paid any attention mm-hmm, to, and that mm-hmm. makes me a bit sad. Yeah, yeah you know, some yeah. of these are very important textual. Oh, I, I stand. You know, putting my hand yeah. up, I, I stand. I stand. I stand uh, uh, fully repentant, <laughs> <laughs> and, having had it pointed out. So I. 
part of the dissertation, I don't explicitly state it, but I hope to show that there are there is some gendered activity happening. Yes. And another one that I am very interested in is in Mark 16. And I published this in the Comparative Oriental Manuscripts bul- ma- Manuscript Bulletin. Mm-hmm. And it's um, you can find it on my academia. Oh, we'll pop that on the oh, show yeah. notes as well. Um, it's called Was Salome at the Empty Tomb? Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. it is one of the it's, sections in the it's dissertation. Su- it's a super piece. It's um, really good. And, and so some of the, again, some of the earliest copies of, actually, in fact, the four oldest copies of Mark 16 have four different stories. Mm. Mm. Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Babiensis, and Codex Beze each provide a completely different narrative mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> of yes, what yes, took yes. place between Mark 1547 mm-hmm. at the entombment and Mark 16 when mm-hmm. the women buy spices and go to the tomb. So to, to me, that's saying, what is going on here? Mm. Why is there such a major textual problem? Actually, I should say Mark 1540 because Codex Vaticanus says that there are four women at the cross. <laughs> well, it, and, 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 and the thing is that, that so helpful about that is our eyes keep getting drawn to the, the absolute ending of Mark 16, mm-hmm. 8, and then, and then you know. And, and Shorter, the longer and, ending. Yeah, and, and I, I love that stuff, don't I? I mean, I, I think that's just some of the most interesting stuff there is. But I think because we get so obsessed with that, we're not looking earlier in the story to see other fascinating variants that, that are going on there. Yeah, and I'm I'm opening up the possibility that you and act. You know, some people have theorized, oh, maybe the text was cut off at mm-hmm. Mark sixteen eight. Why? And it's like, well, maybe there's something problematic about the women. I know I'm not the first to suggest that, mm-hmm. but um, what I'm basically saying that in this case, it might be something about. You know, Salome herself may have been controversial. Mm-hmm. She's not there in Codex Beze or Babiensis. She mm-hmm. does not go to the empty tomb. Or in, Matthew, or in any manuscript of Matthew, I think. Oh, well, no, not in Matthew. Oh, in all Luke. Luke, yeah. But in, so, I mean, even in Mark. In Mark, yeah. she's not right, there. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two of yeah. these... To but that, but I mean, copies. I mean, I mentioned that because it means that it, it's, it's entirely possible that Matthew was looking at a version of Mark right. that didn't have Salome. Exactly, in as well. that's what I'm. Tr- that's what I'm opening yeah. up here. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's possible that that Salome wasn't actually there in the mm-hmm. initial text of Mark. So why would people change the text? And I mm-hmm. basically say, oh, there seems to be. If you look at the at the text, the most unstable verse is Mark 15, 47, which is the the person who's at the entombment, uh, this Mary Magdalene, and who is this other Mary that mm-hmm. is with her. And the text is totally unstable, because they say like 17 different things. is Mary of James, Mary of Joseph, Mary of mm. Joseph, Mary of James and Joseph, Ma- the yeah. other Mary. It could yeah. say a million, yeah. well, 17 different things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and so I'm what I'm basically saying is I think there might have been some controversy around this identity of Mary, the mother of James the Lesser, mm. and Joseph. And could it be because some people were indeed identifying her as the mother of Jesus right. because of the list of Jesus's yeah. brothers in Mark 6, 3? Um, this one, I think, is a really exciting variant because it's possible that Mark does present Jesus's mother at the Absolutely. cross, but he's just, I think, I, yeah. I think it is. I, I mean, I, I mean, I've spent lots of time staring at, at, at uh at Mark fifteen and sixteen, and then talking through these things with you and reading your dissertation, I think I think it is. And what's more, I think Matthew is. It, it, you can make a case that Matthew thinks it was as well because he uses. You just mentioned the other Mary, yeah. Which Matthew says, well, in Matthew's gospel, there is one other Mary, and she True. was Jesus's mum. So, so it's possible that that Mark just he's a little bit standoffish about Jesus's family. This wouldn't mm-hmm. be the only place that he right. does that in his gospel. But then it's a problem. So Mark six three is not as much of a problem because this is his mother who is Mary. These are his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judah. That that in interpretation history, they said, oh, those are his stepbrothers or mm-hmm. something, or maybe even his half brothers. But if you say that Mary is the mother yeah, of James yeah, and yeah. Joseph, then she has birthed other sons. Right, yeah, and this yeah. is going to be problematic yeah, starting yeah. as far back as the second, third, fourth centuries, which is, you know, third and fourth centuries are when our earliest manuscripts show up. That's a problem for Mary's perpetual virginity, Mm -hmm. which is a huge conversation in early Christianity. Mm -hmm. Origen talks about that. Jerome talks about it. Helvidius, Jovinian. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Did Mary birth other sons? And I'm saying, could it be that this distinction between Mary... Uh, the mother of James and Mary of Joseph, or mm-hmm. the mother of Joseph. Mm-hmm. Perhaps there was a, a purposeful desire to distinguish those mm-hmm. two women, because then if you have two, so so Codus Vaticanus, as I was mentioning, um, has this little extra one letter that it yeah. includes at Mark fifteen forty <laughs> that splits this woman into two. Instead yeah. of Mary, the mother of James the Lesser and Joseph, by adding one letter, if you you'll have to look at the Greek yeah. to see what's going on, it becomes. Mary, the mother of James the Lesser, sorry, Mary of James the Lesser, 
and, and the mother of Joseph. Yeah, yeah. And then when you get to Mark 15, 47, it's Mary of Joseph at the empty mm-hmm. at the entombment. And then mm-hmm. 16, 1 is Mary of James at the mm-hmm. empty tomb. And so then she's sort of been split in two. So in Codex Vaticanus, there are four women at the cross mm-hmm. and Mary of James is a different woman than Mary of Joseph. And I'm saying that solves, mm-hmm. Codex Vaticanus yeah. solves the yeah. problem of whether this is Jesus's mother because so, they're different people. Right. So, and this illustrates so well, doesn't it? That textual variants are not just for us geeks. If you don't mind me, oh, be a geek too, because I know that we enjoy geeking up. They're not just for us geeks because they are theologically really important. They're telling us stories that we can also see reflected in Christian debates, ancient Christian debates. So they're not just something, you know, for the for the nerds. They're, they are basically something that tell us hugely important theological and historical things about the discussions that were going on within early Christian Absolutely. Circles. And um, people often don't want to think about how the debates in early Christianity might have affected the outcome of the text mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. – People right. want to feel, oh, we've figured it out. Mm-hmm. We know. We yeah, know what the text yeah. is. And what I basically land on in this section is we do not know what mm-hmm. Mark wrote here. Mm-hmm. We cannot know. Mm-hmm. There's the, the, there is too much of a textual note of instability, and there's too much controversy around um, Jesus's mother and her virginity and also mm-hmm. around Salome and I guess also around Mary Magdalene mm-hmm. that, that this is such a controversial group of women that we mm-hmm. that the, the manuscripts just – it's like a, this gaping maw of uncertainty yeah, if you yeah. look at the textual record. And it's a big question mark. We don't mm-hmm. actually know what Mark wrote. Of mm-hmm. course, if you prefer, you can just look at your Bible and yeah. say, I know what the text is, even <laughs> yeah. though the text doesn't quite make sense. Mm-hmm. Because in in your Bible, you can open it up right now. If you look at Mark 1540, it'll say very, very clear that there's a list of three women. Mm-hmm. But then Mark 1547 identifies Mary of Joseph. Mm-hmm. And Mark 16.1 says Mary of James. Mm-hmm. Which one is she? It doesn't quite yeah, make right, sense. And right. you can just say, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> and you can just say, yeah. who knows? Or you can say, you know what? Maybe something has mangled the text mm-hmm. in the textual transmission. And is that part of the gospel too? You're right, yeah, yeah. The yeah. possible, yeah. the possible, uh, it's, I, what I basically land on is that the gospel has always been a conversation between what the evangelists wrote mm-hmm. and those people who transmitted and received right. the text. And that has always been a conversation in the gospel. And maybe it's even in that inability to receive mm-hmm. that there's something for us today mm-hmm. in the gospel that is theologically important. I used to not be able to talk about theology because <laughs> I was in a religious study. <laughs> now I'm a professor at a Catholic yeah. university, yeah. so I can talk about <laughs> theology. And for me, I think that that's actually mm-hmm. deeply meaningful. This The gospel's in part... There are parts about the gospel that people could not receive, Mm -hmm. and we have to wrestle with that and Mm -hmm. ponder it, and that's part of our meditation on Scripture. Mm -hmm. For me, it's part of the meaning of Scripture. I I find that really helpful, actually, because, I mean, people have often said to me over the years when when I I, I suppose I'm better known for doing work on the synoptics than for other things, but I haven't written much on the synoptics recently, but people will say, well, you know, why are you so interested in that? I mean, do you like filling in crossword puzzles? Is it? it, (laughs) And, and one of the, th- the answers I've always given is, well, if you look at variant variations between the Gospels and the New Testament, even just stick with those, you're looking at a conversation that's yes. going on. And if you have a conversation that's going on and a story that's being told and developed and changing within the pages of the canon, mm-hmm. that says something quite interesting theologically, it seems to me. And I'm not very good at doing theology or anything, but I do understand the stakes in yeah. what we're doing historically for those that go away and reflect on these things theologically. So I think it's valuable what you're doing there. And and of course, yeah, like, like you say, in, your job description has changed. So, yeah. so now, now you're able to lean into theology as much as you wish. But will, but for you, is there is there a big theological takeaway from your work? I mean, it, do, do you feel that it's changed the way that you think about the Bible, about Jesus, about the disciples, the women that surrounded Jesus? Mm-hmm. Has, it, has it changed your thinking, the, the work that you've done here? I think it has. You know, when I when I first entered the field, as so many people do, I was like, you know, I, I my question was, oh, was the text of John 11 changed? Did they mess with it because they didn't want Mary Magdalene to be too prominent? And, you know, that's, that's sort of something that is pretty straightforward. Like, what did John the evangelist write? We need to recover that one mm-hmm. singular text. Mm-hmm. But over the course of this dissertation, I, I came to come to perhaps like a softer perspective, which is to say, 
we can't always know. And I think actually in the case of John 11, I have a position, but I concede we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't actually know whether Martha was added or in some places like taken away. And and that's okay. Mm -hmm. There's something about about the conversation itself that is, I think, an encouragement to everyone to to not use, to not weaponize the Bible, yeah, yeah, to, to use yeah. it to say, insist and say, this is the word of God. The word of God is clear. And it's like, well, maybe your printed KJV is clear, mm-hmm. you know, but mm-hmm. if you actually look at where it came from, it's sometimes there's a lot of conversation. And I feel as though there is something, something more profound that I also learned from this, which is it, not to insist, mm-hmm. not to insist that this is the one way mm-hmm. and you must, sometimes it's clear, like, okay, well, they probably, the, the angel at the pool in John chapter five was probably added later, mm-hmm. you know, that that piece is probably not, mm-hmm. you know, but, and you can make arguments for that. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, people are changing it later, mm-hmm. but sometimes we don't actually know. And there's something in that uncertainty and that mystery that I think should bring, it mm-hmm. brings humility. Mm-hmm. It brings humility to our I, approach to that's really helpful. And I think, you know, as, as scholars, I think sometimes we could do with a dose of humility about yeah. these things. <laughs> and, and I like what you say as well very much about not weaponizing the mm. Bible. You know, we can we can see multiple cases of that. I mean, this podcast it has a, a kind of subtitle, uh, um, a historical approach to the New Testament. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I, int- I, I notice when I get feedback is people say that to me quite often that, they, they quite enjoy a historical approach to the New Testament, not because it necessarily changes or, or revises their kind of theological views, but it can be a little bit less intense. Mm-hmm. It can be a little less, it can be a little bit less, people have a little bit less invested in it and therefore yeah, you can actually... Charged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you coming out of this see yourself more as a historian or more as a theologian and or is that just a completely it's so artificial funny because way when to I'm think in a theology this? situation everyone yeah. thinks I'm an, a historian <laughs> and when I'm in a his- yeah. historical situation th- people think I'm a theologian I always kind of like to dance in between the mm-hmm. two I'm interested in both I mean I was raised in the episcopal tradition and I'm still an episcopalian so um, we always say scripture contains everything necessary to salvation that's sort of the anglican way of approaching scripture mm-hmm. it's not it's not biblical inerrancy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's not saying this is like the perfect word because humans mm-hmm. did have some part in it, but it mm-hmm. contains everything mm-hmm. necessary to mm-hmm. salvation. And I'm interested in the possibility of maybe scripture mm-hmm. means the variants mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And the variants are perhaps necessary for oh. our salvation. Mm-hmm. To me, Very that's, nice. that's yeah, yeah, I think mm-hmm. that's a fun mm-hmm. approach just to, to bring that humility, mm-hmm. that uncertainty, and to say the encounter with Jesus it has always been about not just this perfect thing that was revealed, but how it plays out in the world and how it takes us time mm-hmm. sometimes to to reckon with certain things that we might not like. And also to have wisdom mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. it over time and to say, you know, we interpreted it that way for a very long time. And we don't really like how it's turning out. And it's okay mm-hmm. for us to revisit and say, maybe we don't have to look at that text in such a rigid way. Maybe we can come, we can look at these variants and it can say there was always multiple ways, not just of interpreting the text, but even of the text as it stands. Mm-hmm. Even that was very var- was variant throughout time. And just sort of an embrace of that. And in some ways, as you also pointed out to me, a recovery of some of these marginalized mm-hmm. voices. So sort of an embrace of multiple ways of looking at it. You know, it's all right if sometimes, like in Luke's gospel, it says that there's people of God's goodwill instead of goodwill toward people, or like the question of whether a prophet arises in Galilee, or whether it's the prophet or a prophet, just to say that we don't have to say the the person who disagrees with us is wrong. We can say this is how scripture was for many people, mm-hmm. and to include all of these sort of voices throughout the centuries. Yeah, that's great. So Libby, what's next? <laughs> what's next? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I feel sort of bad sort of saying that because um, you've, 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 uh, you've been prolific, not just in writing uh, this dissertation in recent years, but also in publishing on, uh, publishing on adjacent topics. Um, what, what, are you, what are you hoping to do in your research next? Well, certainly, um, this book is it has a it's a proposal now, mm-hmm. and so <laughs> you know, fingers crossed that uh, it'll be published somewhere soon. I I'm actually very interested. Uh, Mark and I were kind of geeking out yesterday because the next the latest Oxyrhynchus volume oh my goodness, has yeah. these, um, and and yeah, it's entirely possible <laughs> that an episode of the NT Pod might have come out 
on that before this interview goes out okay. because I'm thinking of recording on it this weekend. I'll, I'll, uh, so so uh, it may be that listeners already know about this. Depends if I get my act together or not. But you're probably going to be talking about Pioxy 5575, yes, five, yes, which is a second century five, copy five, of Sayings five, yeah, of Jesus. Yeah. But this exact same Oxyrhynchus volume also has mm-hmm. a previous previously unknown dialogue between Jesus and Mary, yeah. who could be the composite Mary, as you have argued for, yeah. could be Mary mm-hmm. Magdalene. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that's that's exciting. I, maybe, I'm, I'm thinking right now, I'm still kind of pondering, could this be part of that missing section of the Gospel of Mary? Mm. So in the Berlin Codex, there's, which is the most complete, it's in Coptic, the closest to a complete copy we have of the Gospel of Mary. It starts sort of in the middle, and then there's also four pages missing right when Mary starts to talk about her vision of mm-hmm. Jesus. And this um, this Oxyrhynchus fragment is Jesus talking to Mary and giving her a sort of revelation. And one of the things that I'm thinking about, it, actually Silke Peterson raised the question at uh, SNTS in Vienna, and I'm continuing to think about that. Could this be part of the Gospel of Mary? And so I'm Wonderful. I'm sort of pondering that and so that's that's one thing I'm thinking about but um I mean that's so exciting I mean it, it's uh, it's one of those uh, I love questions where either answer is exciting so mm. so is this part of the gospel of Mary if the answer is yes that is unbelievably exciting that we've got more of the gospel of Mary and it if would the make an- the gospel of Mary a Valentinian text which right. is In- crazy <laughs> and right and if the answer is no then it means we have got a fragment of something else. That's right. That, Yet another uh, I mean, like so, thing that shows that yeah. Mary was like a special disciple. Okay, so there's either way. I agree. It's a very yeah. so maybe fragment. maybe we'll have to get you back on the podcast <clears throat> to talk about that uh, in due course because well, I mean it's so <laughs> exciting that that uh, now that is. P oxy five five seven seven. seven. Okay, yes. fantastic. Yeah, I saw it for the first time last night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we William Johnson loaned me yeah. his copy, and yeah. we were able to look at the plates. Look at this! Oh my gosh, we were just yes. freaking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Libby, for coming on to the podcast. My and, pleasure. And thank sharing you for letting me talk about my research. It's been it's been great. I I, I said to several people when when uh, I told them that you were coming on the podcast that uh, you know I was really looking forward to talking to her and several people said you know they couldn't imagine a better Aww, guest so, so that's very so, kind so there you go so thank you so much for uh, being with us today and thank you to everyone for listening and thanks to mark for letting me share my work thanks so much to dr elizabeth schrader Pulser for that great conversation i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did you'll find some links to her work in the show notes and you can find her on twitter at libby schrader or find her homepage at www. do we still say that www.elizabethschrader.com You can find more episodes of the NT Pod at podacre.blogspot.com or on my YouTube channel or wherever you go for your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.